Remember, this show is PG-13, so you might hear a naughty word or two. Simone's final 2023 gift to us is posting some crazy ass skills. We're going to discuss them. The average age at world championships was once again over 20 years old. We'll discuss the FIG report. Highlights from the college gymnastics preview nights. We have a mini commission about Maroney's 2012 Olympic vaults, and it's the gymnastics year in review highlights controversies and our favorite moments this is december 18th 2023 and welcome to gymcastic the number one gymnastics podcast in the galaxy i'm jessica and i'm here with spencer from the balance beam situation which posts gifts a gift review every week of all the things that happen in college gymnastics and it's the highlight soon. of my week it's soon we're almost coming there. so soon before you go on vacation, remember to set your podcast player to automatically download the Gymcastic episodes. It's very important. You don't want to be stuck traveling without us. We will help you through any situation. So before you get on a plane or don't have Wi-Fi, set to automatically download. You're welcome ahead of time. So a couple things happening, you guys. The virtual live show season pass where you get basically for a live show virtual tickets for the price of three um is on sale now so you can get that uh gymcastic fantasy league is launching on friday so you'll be able to uh what is it called when you recruit your players you draft draft your team yes college and cocktails your full menu is available now including mocktails so your full 2024 menu it's already up um there's a link in the forum and if you want to get our newsletter that goes out every week that has all this information in it and already had links to all of it um you can go to the navigation at gymcastic.com about and gymcastic newsletters all the links for what i'm talking about right now are in the show notes so that's the update for okay. what's happening at gymnastic now let's get to the important things yeah like gymnastics i would like I, last week we did uh jessica recaps what's happening on social media for spencer which i really appreciated so that i don't have to look at it so i think we should start by doing that again like tell me what i don't have to look at any social media which is great and jessica just tells me what happens it's like remember that um very short period in the 90s where there would be magazines about what was happening on the internet which is a, no. such a dated concept. It makes me really happy. Um, is this like that? Or is that? It's like a radio show about the internet, which you get to tell me about it. I do not remember that era at all. Um, okay. So Simone put up in her Instagram story, which are a vis visual listener we are going to watch right now. So she put up a video of herself doing a double layout, double out. So she's layout on the first one and then a double twist on the second flip, second layout, an Aminar, a Rise Guang. So, which is the Yurchenko full in, yes. double back, full twist, which she showed. She did a freaking, these are all onto a mat, um, into the pit or onto like a resi. She also showed herself doing a piked stalter and making sounds like, Hoo! and then, <laughs> and Zoe Miller <laughs> reacting like, I know how to do that. <laughs> My being like, mm, that was a nice try, but um, I'm <laughs> way better at bars than you, but that's cute. Um, she also showed herself during um, your ch a Schaefer, a freaking Schaefer, which is so freaking amazing. Like, as on in the what? Beam, though? Not on the beam. She did it onto the resi, but she tagged Paulina Schaefer and was like, oh, I finally, my mind couldn't get it. But so it's a half, it's a side flip quarter turn quarter no half. half it's a side flip half turn where you do you flip and when you're upside down then you half turn and it looks freaking nuts um she also did a yurchenko half on double front full yurchenko half yeah. on double front full not a chung that's her, i mean chung that's, her, with another. that's biles she has yeah. that one named after herself right which is amazing um and then she did a toe on chapas uprise immediate to Kacha. so Grabs the bar, up rise. Clear hip to Kachev pipe. Oh, it is. It's a, oh, that's true. It it's is not a just it Kachev. Is. She was doing that in the past. Clear I feel like hip that's, to Kachev pike. That's implied from the uprise because an uprise is into a free yeah. hip position, but, but that's very good Tkachev, clarification. Thank you. The Kachev is piked. It yeah. was my main clarification. And she didn't make it, uh, but. 
but it's the one I'm most interested in out of all of these things. Because I'm like, there we go. Because you felt like she had to change. We talked about last this past year, she had to change her bars routine because of the Takacha of repetition rules. So she had to get rid of some things. And she put in, she was doing Maloney, toe on Shaposh to Giant Full, then to Takacha of Piked. And the Giant Full, it worked, but it kind of felt like a placeholder element. Because she's counting a C skill in her routine, and it's Simone Biles, and she doesn't have to count C skills. It's like that's for pedestrians. So it felt that always felt like a placeholder. So I'm excited about this as a realistic possibility, even though she did not catch it in this video. I feel like it's doable, and I'm excited about what that could mean for the efficiency of her bars uh, composition and the in potential increase in D score. It's exciting things. She was like, uh, you're welcome, everybody. And now I'm yeah. going to go party for a week. I also love that we get all these videos when, like, Cecile is gone. Cecile goes, like, <laughs> back home to France. <laughs> and now everyone's just playing. <laughs> yes. It's just, like, let's learn all new skills. I mean, I'm sure she's done these over, uh, you know, over time. And she's just compiling them now. But it looks like, you know, I love that it just looks like everything goes, like, crazy. And they just party in there when Cecile's gone. <laughs> So the FIG does this report every year after Worlds, um, and it's fascinating. It has tons mm -hmm. of data in it. It oh, still it. doesn't have, for the public and for the media, it still doesn't have the artistry scores. I know. I know. Which the FIG itself has put in the their technical minutes that they've asked for the Longines to separate the scores so they can um, – be available but the federations do get the artistry scores they get their own reports that have their artistry scores but the public doesn't get it which is like why that just makes yeah. no sense to me so anywho what did we find out most importantly <laughs> most excitedly for jessica i was reading this whole report and i had to synthesize it because i was like i could talk about this for months and it would be so boring and i would love it i would just be <laughs> thrilled the entire time and it would be unlistenable but big thing so they have their typical annual report on the age of the competitors at yeah. the world championships which this year once again showed an increase in the average age of the women's competitors at worlds 20.35 this year which is the highest on the chart that they have provided since 2017 over 24 a second straight worlds so you know as we get toward the olympics and then you read articles that are like, gymnastics, traditionally a sport for teenagers, but Simone Biles, an old grandma. And you like scream at the computer or phone while you're reading it. You now, this is your ammunition when you write your angry complaint. You have your evidence is this FIG report where the average age at Worlds was 20.35. And we've linked, we'll link to it in the show notes so that you can just link that easily when you write your complaints that you obviously will. I just feel like, this is so excellent to add to our four-year headlines. We need to add the hmm. how to rebut instructional for the four-year yeah. headlines. We but need, don't like, do it template? at us, you guys. Yeah. What? We need a template to like give people yes. just like fill in the blank like a Mad Libs of <laughs> yes. the horrible a complaint about an article. There's a lot of times like people reply to us like that's not correct. I was like, you guys, you meant to reply to People Magazine or make sure to tag People Magazine or the author of this article. Like, don't reply to us. We're not the ones that wrote it. We're aggregating the news. Like, here's the instructions. Make sure the author of the publication are in there. And so they can, you know, be like, hey, your fact checker didn't do the fact checks. Okay. Um, Overall, we also yeah. saw. So competitors 18 plus was 73 percent of competitors under 18 was 27 percent of competitors which is also if people are writing about age next year 27 percent would be minors in the u.s 73 percent would be majors in the u.s right yes um i love this i love it so much um okay <laughs> it's my favorite kind of chart ever and this is going back to like 2017. It's been not teenagers for a very yeah, long we also time now. Have a pretty dramatic increase even since 2018, which was 19.37, and now we're at 20.35. A year is a lot mm -hmm. of an inch just since 2018. Like that's a big jump in age in the last couple of years, which I think would also be interesting to go into the reasons why. 
And how did you feel about the uh, score execution situation? Where yes, are we it that? puts into stark relief our issues with the outlier that is vault execution scoring versus the other events because average e-score for vaults at worlds this year was in the 8.7s compared to bars and beam at 7.2 floor at 7.4 and then even the average final scores for your first vault is like eight to ten tenths higher than the other apparatuses which is you know it's out of line i would like them all to be able to score equally for my sensibilities that would help me a lot and i think you know doubling the deductions on vault is and always will be a great idea yes just do it already i can't stand <laughs> a chart that's out of whack like this it's i it's, know my yeah. favorite charts in this i have to say were the um pie charts because they looked so delicious like they looked like candies and i wanted to eat them just i'm gonna put that out there they look really <laughs> good i'm like i would like to eat this right now i want to eat that's this pie from card. A colorblind gym nerd. So that's maybe saying that's a lot. why. Maybe I couldn't tell what they're exactly what terrible color choices they made. <laughs> we had a lot of developments in. Oh wait, are we ready for college, or is there more you want to talk about in the report? Um, the, oh, the only other thing I wanted to say was Beam. Just they have a comparison between you know execution scores every year at Worlds on Beam, and it is always funny to look at the comparison to 2017 Worlds, which was the year everyone just got a zero. <laughs> The, the average beam score was six. The average beam execution score was six point zero that year. <sighs> the average. It was beautiful. My um, dream. This year, more than a point higher than that, and also quite a bit higher than last year, which I reacted to because I was like, "Oh, I, that." My impression was it like, "Oh, beam scores were way, way higher this year than they were at Worlds last year." But then I was like, "Let's see how many falls that's taking into account." So there were forty-four beam falls at Worlds this year, and there were eighty-seven at Worlds last year which is quite a bit different. And I was like, well, I know what Jessica's going to say. She's going to say, when you don't put have water dripping on the beam, people can stay on a lot more. But that was yeah. just one day. <laughs> but still. Still. That's a, so we, a huge difference in far, yeah. far fewer falls on beam at Worlds this year. And I thought that was interesting. It's almost like when they have all those things that they, they you know, address with the apparatus, all of the things that they measure and lasers and tension and all of that, they should have like a wetness meter. And if the beam is too wet, they should not have people do it. There's got to be like a humidity, a touchy humidity, a meter, o meter thing. Some mm -hmm. scientists write in and tell me what I need That's to suggest. Yeah. Club Gym Nerd. You get discounts and first dibs on live show tickets, an extra whole podcast every week, athlete dossiers for major competitions, code guides, options to commission your own segments. It also makes a great gift. Check it out at gymcastic.com at the Join the Club tab. So yeah. developments this week, a bunch of the college teams with Olympians and world champions on them and your favorite elites mm -hmm. coming in as uh, freshmen had um, their hype nights, which is what I'm going to call them. No matter what they call them, I'm calling them hype yeah. nights. This is my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, and so we saw UCLA, LSU, Utah. Mm -hmm. Who those stood were out the, to you? Those were streaming. There were also some others. And, you know, schools have put up videos on the socials, allegedly. Um, big news, I think the biggest news from watching any of those was watching LSU and seeing Connor McLean. Because the big question was, Obviously, we know her level of gymnastics. She hasn't competed in a long time. Is she healthy? Is she able to do things? Where is she right now? And her answer to that was yes, because she looked really, really good and quite far along and ready to go, particularly on beam and floor. She was doing her two foot layout on beam with, you know, overall a really strong set, put it at the end of the lineup with Aaliyah and Haley Bryant and just she's right in there, ready to do a double lay on floor and looked that was like beam we know that was floor i was really interested to see she had a complete ready to go college floor routine with a double layout and so it was like oh she's ready she's ready she's ready for lsu she's going if lsu doesn't win or at least match their highest finish which was second right is that the yeah. highest uh, yeah. they finish as a team the problem will lay squarely at jay clark's feet because this team there's no reason there's just yeah, no they have, it's super stacked yeah they're just they look so good like the sticking of the vaults was and it was yeah. good form real sticking. and Aaliyah was only doing beam 
even without yeah. her on most of the events. Although, and they said they anticipate when the season starts, she'll be ready to go on everything. Yeah. UCLA, who mm-hmm. does, can I just say, the best yeah. type night. It's broadcast, it's on TV <laughs> for a good reason because they understand that this is not a meet. So you can do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> that is the whole point. Yeah. You can wear a skirt if you want. <laughs> you can have the have routines that go into the stands. Like, it's not a real meet. Enjoy it. So they have the blue carpet where before floor, they do a runway show with leotards that are custom made just for the hype night. They're not leotards they're going to wear during mm-hmm. season necessarily. So we had, um, for example, Naya yeah. Reed, you remember her from Florida. She graduated from mm-hmm. Florida. She wore her sorority leotard, which I don't know the name of the sorority, but I do know that this, with a matching floor routine and choreography, this is why she can be in her sorority and do gymnastics because they're not like the typical uh, like find for not showing up for a party sororities. And for everyone that had a great experience at a sorority, that's awesome for you. I'm totally stoked. I'm sure she's <laughs> having a great not like to hear one. about this. <laughs> It's good for you. Don't tell me about it. If you're in her sorority, I'd love to hear about it. Um, yeah. Anyway. The UCLA's preview meet is definitely about the floor routines. They're like, we're going to do three other events a little. And then, and I have some like, you know, do you have enough depth on bars and beam? But it was really about the floor routines. And I think it was, I think this is BJ's best group of floor routines. Yes. We've seen. I think top to bottom, it was the deepest and strongest of her choreography. Yep. My favorite, I'm going to say, I'm going out there with my favorite right away, which is Caitlin Rosen's, because item one, she is literally brewing a potion at the beginning of this routine, and I'm like, well, 10 check marks. You already hit the Spencer Spencer special. (laughs) Give me witchcraft and a whiff of an unhappy ending, and it's my favorite (laughs) floor routine. We know that. It's like, if you're not going to do Pain of a Nation, you have to do witchcraft, and Caitlin Rosen is doing witchcraft. I thought it was great. And I love she she walked out with a cape, right? Wasn't that her that walked out with a cape yeah, on the blue carpet? She's very ready to be a UCLA gymnast, doing a little like bow presentation at the end of her curtsy, at the end of her beam. I was like, oh, she has been wanting to be a, do this for a long time. She's ready. And she, like the Minnesota, uh, the Twin City Twisters, where she comes from, like, first of all, I'm so excited that UCLA finally has like someone from that gym long line of great elites maggie um nichols Mm. whose book is coming out it's in our gift guide by the way make sure you pre-order her book um and uh grace mccallum so i'm excited for that Mm. but also like they're one of the teams that like really tries to perform in their uh in their elite routines even though they're just you know they have to elite. They're so, still elite. Routine. They're still they're elite. elite. So I'm like, oh, you can see it right here. And then Che, obviously, with her Black Panther Leo. Oh, so good. And her Black so Panther good. choreography. Oh, I'm emphasizing the damn. Da- oh, I loved it so much. It's she so has good. had a great, re- like, no skips in Che's no. album of floor routines. I think they've all been hits, and this one is excellent. Yeah, and I love this Leo so much. Um, and I, I just feel like I think Naya Reeds is the one that's going to go viral, but Che wasn't going full out in her routine, so I'm waiting. That might be the one that goes viral. But right, my I feel first like initial pick virality has really overlooked Che in a way that's unfair. It is. And I would really like for her to be the most famous UCLA floor worker in the history of time because yeah. that is what her routines deserve. Well, the whole team, when they do their Black Excellence meet, the whole team should wear that leotard, and then she should do her... Black Panther routine. And that yeah, I nice. can the whole team wear that leotard and ditch some of these other ones? <laughs> some of their I typical know. ones? The leotards at UCLA have really gone downhill, <laughs> you guys. Like, they've really, they're over-designed. Like, there's there's some I like, but there's some that are just like, oh, it's too much. They did bring back the backless leotard again, which is go very Minnesota uh, this year. <laughs> um, okay, Utah. Yeah, we saw Utah. They looked like, you know, n- no ill effects, maybe? Like, there, <laughs> it wasn't just, like, you know, a disaster area in their preview, which you feel like it could have been based on the offseason. I think the most impressive part, or not necessarily, not necessarily surprising, but important part for their performance was Grace McCallum being back all four events, returning. She was injured, if you recall, on vault last season. She came back right at the very end of the year to do bars and beam, but wasn't able to do vault and floor at that point. I think she's going to be, you know, 
excessively important for Utah this year, obviously, because it's Grace McCallum, particularly on floor. So that was really nice to see her come back. Yeah. Um, and also Utah got, um, they are getting a free six month truck or Jeep lease from their collective, also paying for insurance. They are branded cars, which is, uh, we talked about this in behind the scenes. So my only problem with branded <laughs> cars. really stressed out by this. Branded cars, easier to stalk people when you see the, the branded car and then you can follow them home. That's my only problem oh, with it. Say you're like, mm, I don't want this. Can you get the cash value of whatever this is in exchange? Like, I don't want the car. I would like cash instead no way no way unless this is the, i'm gonna say no way because basically it's just a sponsorship so like the sponsor has to get something so unless you say can i get the cash value in exchange for i'll come to the store and do i mean you probably can't do gymnastics because that's probably against the rules somehow but mm, i'll do yeah. a public appearance for the mm -hmm. same amount or i'll do some promotion for you uh in exchange for the money you could probably do that <laughs> How about just the money for doing nothing? Where are we on that as a culture? Because no. I feel like we're not doing enough of that. Yeah, I know. That would be great. Universal, what's it called? Universal minimum Universal income? Universal NIL. <laughs> <laughs> I universal. would like that. Yeah. Yeah, universal income. That's what we're waiting for. Let's discuss the year as a whole and mm -hmm. the, the historic moments, plus my feelings moments thrown in. Yes. Okay, so want to go through, it was 2023, it was a year, it happened, <laughs> we have difficulty differentiating, maybe sometimes certain people, Jessica, between what ha things that happened in 2023 and things that happened in 2022 or 2021, or haven't happened yet and only happened in a dream or a conversation you had with Fact Checker. So I want to go <laughs> through, these were the things that happened, the historic- How dare you? Game-changing moments- that will go down in history from 2023, the timeline that we experienced. So on March 10th, we had Haley Bryant scoring three tens in a single meet, which does not happen much. It was the first time since Jamie Dancher in 2002, which we talked about because Trinity never did that, co-record holder. Maggie Nichols never had three in the same meet. Kyla Ross never had three in the same meet. There were some people we assumed would have done that at yeah. a certain point who didn't because it was the you know first time in over 20 years we've been on 40 watch for years now mm -hmm. and it didn't happen but at least we got a 30 in one meet uh also <laughs> oh, she got a 30 and beam which is its own <laughs> category of trophy a perfect 30 and then beams also an event uh in march also we learned that olympic champion sophomore at auburn suny lee had to stop uh competing in college due to a kidney condition and later she revealed that she had gained uh 40 pounds in water weight uh during that period she posted some pictures on her TikTok. um and some days her hands she wakes up and her hands are too swollen to do bars to fit into her grips or hold onto the bar and she does not wish to reveal the name of the condition but it has uh it prevented her from finishing her college season. On April 12th, the British women's team won its first ever European team championship. Another one of those things where it's like, wait, that's the first time that's happened? The British women hadn't won the team competition? And then you're like, oh, right, the Soviet Union. <laughs> oh, right, Romania. There was no time for anyone else for most of this. Uh, on Three days later, on April 15th, Trinity Thomas tied the all-time tens record in her final career competition on 28 tens, tying Jenny Hansen and Jamie Dancer <laughs> to confirm Jessica's dream that everything is a tie between all of the best ones. And we now have a three-way tie for tens record how if you had to pick how long do you think that's going to stand before it gets broken if the stick no if pull is i'm forced. asking i'm asking for a what you think a prediction you don't have to be right because you're not going to be because it's the future but if you had to predict i think it'll be another I'm going to say 10 years. I think that's solid. I'm I'm going to go like seven, seven years, because I was looking at the list on the balancebeamsituation.com or actually just balancebeamsituation.com. It's almost like I should know the name of my own website, but I don't. <laughs> um, 
Haley Bryant, if she were to get nine tens each of the next two seasons, she would tie it, which I don't think is going to happen. That's a lot. But also, it's not like... I mean, it's not impossible sting. for her. She could totally do she it. She gets like five on vault. You wouldn't be that surprised because anytime yes. she sticks. And then a couple more scattered in there. And then she takes a COVID year. Like, it's a lot. But like, we're going to have every few years someone who's at least believably in contention to break this. So I don't think it's going to stand for too, too long. I wish she would do elite. I wish, I mean, she needs to be happy and do whatever she wants, but I'm just like, my God. I feel like if you were maybe like starting a professional gymnastics league, she would be a great person to have like as an introductory star to the first draft class or whatever. Yes. That's what I'm going to, I'm going to throw that out there. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that. <laughs> She's amazing. If also, if someone were doing a post Olympic tour, yeah, I would for sure invite her on the post Olympic tour because mm-hmm. she's incredible. And can she dance though? You have to be able to dance to do the the tour. So that's what we need to find out. You have to dance, dance, not not gymnastics floor, gymnastics dance. <laughs> fake dance. So we need we need to see some of that. Um, okay, so the next thing that happened. Very important. August 5th. Simone Biles and Suni Lee become the first duo of prior Olympic all-around champions to compete together in the same meet in 57 years and did it for the first time ever at a national competition. 57 years. Mm Mm-hmm. So cool. So exciting. And it was so we were so excited to see that Suni was healthy enough to come back and compete at all. That was amazing. August 27th, Simone Biles won her eighth U.S. National Championship, a record, of course, because it's Simone. Eight. Eight eight going on nine. Do you think? But that also, like, next year, nine. Okay, well, then you you have to get double digits. Like, you have to make it an even 10. So then, obviously, you have to compete (laughs) past 2024. Those are just the rules of numbers. So I'm sorry, Simone, if you thought you were going to stop after 2024. You can't. You can't stop on nine. That's not a thing. If everything goes perfectly and she, you know, wins at least one more gold at the Olympics, maybe two, Mm -hmm. do you think she'll keep going? If the 2028 Olympics, I mean, I actually think she might be done. I think she will probably feel done for a while and then we'll see. But if the 2028 Olympics weren't in the U.S., I would say no. I feel like there will be a lot of I don't want to say pressure on her because that seems more negative than the sentiment that I mean but I think there will be a lot of attention on maybe like going out on at the you know a US hosted Olympics in 2028 Mm. so I could see it that's what I'm saying I could see it on October 1st we got this is so exciting we're at world championships we're in Belgium the site of Simone's very first world championships where she was on the team with Michaela Maroney that's how long Simone has been competing she was on a team with Michaela Maroney in 2014 13 14 13 13, 13 was Simone's first world 10 years Belgium. 10 years previously um and she did her Yurchenko double pike vault mhm got it named First double back salto ever in competed in women's gymnastics at the international mm-hmm. level. And she, we also got confirmation, even though we had had that confirmation because she was getting the official D score in the U S and uh, then memo confirmed the D score at uh, world trials to me. Mm-hmm. We knew officially, officially, officially that her D score was uh, for that double pike a 6.4. So, if even though we talked about Simone's videos that she showed uh, on social media this week, even though I assume, you know, the f- Yurchenko full in, full twisting double tuck is like a fun play around thing, not a real, that's like what you train so that you're prepared to do a Yurchenko yes. double pike vault feels easy. Um, but if she were to do it, technically the trend for vault scores is that they go up four tenths for every half twist. So if she would add a full twist, you would then have to go up eight tenths and that would be a 7.2 D score. Is that what they would do? And then she could just basically not do bars and still win. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You could like, I mean, you would 
fall and still beat people on vault by multiple points. Yeah. So she should totally do it. So she um, should do, if she feels like she could fall on that safely, yeah, it is totally worth doing that knowing you're going to fall because that's how the code works. Fall, <laughs> fall safely and still win. And even though she will have Laurent standing in, which is something that he didn't do previously when she did that vault, but this year confirmed uh, mm -hmm. to me that he was going to stand in for safety because it's not worth it not to stand in. So they're taking that deduction for him standing in because mm -hmm. you're allowed to spot on bars, but you're not allowed to spot on any other event without a deduction. Mm -hmm. And now there's been lobbying to change that so you can also do it on vault and beam um, for uh, dismounts. So... She could still win with the fall and the spotting deduction. Yeah. So I want, like, I want Simone, maybe the post-2024 is that Simone comes back just to prove all the stupid things about gymnastics scoring and the code. And it's like, yeah, the whole point of this is that I can intentionally fall and still beat everyone else on vault, which shouldn't be a thing. Figure it out. I'm going to force you to. I would love that <laughs> as a, a final quad of Simone's gymnastics career. I would love if um, she comes back and then I wouldn't love this, but mm -hmm. I mean, I would love it for the sport, but I won't love it for her that mm -hmm. she comes back and is like, I'm going to do a Rise Guang now uh, and win, even though I fell and had a spot. And they're like, oh, you know what we should do? We should double the e-score vault deductions. Maybe we should do that because it's out of range with the other events. Well, that's exactly what we need to have happen. She fixed right. it. Because Simone can we've fix been anything. That. If we've learned anything she, from the history of gymnastics, Simone right. can fix anything. So, she could, yeah, I think that's You could probably just tweet this scenario and they would fix it. As we've learned oh, from her Twitter sword. Great. That when she wields it, it closes down ranches. So she could do that. On October 2nd. Yes, the very next day, Romania and Australia's women's team returned to the Olympics as teams and qualified again for the first time. In 12 years. A triumphant. Triumphant. Phoenix thriving, rising from the ashes. Which literally was on the Romanian leotard, which was a brilliant artistic touch by their new coaches. Um, also on that day, not historic, but Gadarova, uh, world champion on floor, tore ACL and was out of worlds. She has recently had surgery. So a lot of people saw her doing her prehab, but were like, is she not going to have surgery? So she has had her surgery. And so... It would be unlikely, Thanks but for possible. Bringing the tone down. We were talking about this triumph and how exciting it was, and then Jessica's like, and also Jessica Gatarova tore ACL, and then just okay, wait, just threw I a do... smoke bomb and dis ruined the vibes, and then disappeared, which is supposed to be my job. I do want to say that there is a um, you know women's and men's recovery times are different, but there is a. Um, football player who came back in three or four months was cleared to back to full activity um in three or four months i'm forgetting his name fact checker can write it in there um from an AC already did write it in there um oh he did and adrian peterson thank you <laughs> um oh yeah i was out of the <laughs> i wasn't in the mm -hmm. right chat um mm -hmm. the things that that guy did everything he spent ten thousand dollars of his own money to do everything so he slept in the um hyperbaric chamber what is more oxygen the Hyper barrack chamber more hyperbaric chamber less yeah no um no inflammatory foods um did like uh the you know every single thing you can possibly do for rehab all the extra stuff and he was able to come back that fast so it's like she seems to have the entire Olympic movement of the, you know, British gymnastics in the UK at her fingertips. So if she does all of those things, it would be interested, interesting to see if um, a woman can can't come back in that same time frame. They can also, one of the things that they can do now is they can change your estrogen am amounts um, so that you have less laxity. I think that's why they do it in your ligaments. So like there's hormone control, there's anti-inflammatory stuff. There's the extra oxygen. Like there's so many things that can be done. Um, I'm not even, you know, stem cells and so many other things, but if you do them all at once, like she could be the one that changes the whole timeline. 
Throw, throw everything at her, you guys. I'm like, let's, let's. Conclusion, I want to conclusion. be able to say Jessica someone came back in four months. months. Come on. Okay. Um, yeah, Thank and there's another long story about football. Okay, one more. Th- it's not about football. It's about the science of recovery. Mm, it also, like it there's was about a- football to me, which doesn't count because it's not gymnastics. <laughs> there's another player of the footballs who just tore their Achilles and is supposed to come back already in like two months, right? Wasn't that? Didn't that just happen? Who's that person? Uh, Aaron Rodgers. So, and if we know anything about football, it's that they definitely do things. At for specifically the health and safety of the athletes, that is the first priority. Also, obviously, it's uh, totally exactly the same as gymnastics. And like a, a person that just stands there and throws the ball would be have the same comeback time as someone who has to jump in the air and do multiple flips yeah. and land safely. Now so. I would like fact checkers response to your describing the <laughs> position of quarterback as someone who just stands there and throws the ball. I would like like a 10 minute <laughs> rebuttal. On that. that would be enjoyable for me. Oh, that guy's already cleared. Time. So he was only out from Achilles tear for like two months. That's nuts. Maybe he's just going to play in a cast. I don't know. Because they do that in the football, which is it's not good. But anyway, anyway, you guys, I just wanted to say science. That's the whole point. OK, can we talk <laughs> about the most exciting thing that happened on October 4th? On October 4th, Brazil and France both won the first world team medals for their women's teams, Brazil with silver, France with bronze. Historic. So awesome. So exciting for them. Uh, October 6th. Simone Biles officially, officially, officially becomes the most decorated gymnast ever, moving ahead of Latina. Latina's updated count with her heretofore unknown medal, which moved her up one. Simone officially moved ahead. On October 6th and became the most decorated in history. Talk about rebutting wrong information for the four-year headlines. The people have been reporting that wrong for decades. And finally, it was official. On October 6th, she did it. And then on October 7th, historic, historic. Kaylee Namor became the first gymnast to win a world medal uh, for an African nation with her silver on bars. For Algeria. Okay. So a big year. Lots of lots of historic moments is what we're yeah. saying. And okay, top controversies of the year, which I know is the most exciting thing that everyone is waiting yeah. for. Yeah. Other people are like, no, this gymnast of the year. Boo. If anyone who knows about gymnastics knows that we are not in this for like flips or f- artistry, we are in this for the controversy. So coming in at number 10 on the list of top controversies of 2023 is obviously that time Jessica put Flavia and her world rankings at number 17. I said what I said. <laughs> I stand by it. The real number 10 oh, in okay. controversies okay. Okay. is uh, Sabrina Voinea of Romania not vaulting, Ooh, even yeah. though she got the did not vault light from the judges. So she could have been able to vault again, but she didn't vault so romania is trying to mm-hmm. qualify a team to uh the olympics for the first time in a long time and she didn't go did not vault. um because she so vault. she did an original vault run she ran through but did not get a zero she didn't like you know run right into the vault and get a zero she could have done another run but instead did not so she did get a zero or it did yep. not start Right. Uh, or, I mean, there's many things that happened in Romania. We have Panor, the athlete rep for the FIG, doing so a 45 Your number 10 interview. controversy is just the concept <laughs> of Romania. It's a three way tie. <laughs> athlete rep doing a 45 minute interview on TV about how she was asked not to coach athletes during their podium training. Like, that there was that. Um, or there was the uh, Romanian uh, TV reporter who uh, went up to one of the Romanian gymnasts and called her a jeg, which apparently is an extremely offensive word in Romanian and did that in the mix zone in front of everybody. So that's another allegation that is uh, very, that's another big controversy that happened. So your, th- your three way tie. My three way tie. Uh huh. Okay. For number 10. Number nine, biggest controversies of 2023, an NCAA judge giving a perfect 995 
to the vault from Chloe Clark of Florida, who did a Yurchenko full with a bounce back that got a 975 from one judge, which is a normal college score, and a perfect 995 from another judge. I think quite clearly ranking as the worst single score we've ever seen given out in the history of college gymnastics. Yeah, because as we know, in college, a Yurchenko full is worth a 995. And so yeah. she got a perfect score with a hop. And it big was a hop. bigger hop than Nadia <laughs> did. And when she got her oh, way, way bigger than Nadia. Car, way bigger. Woo, way back. So, and obviously that's nothing to do with Caitlin Clark. It has to do with the, all the problems in college judging, which also nothing my, to do with Chloe Clark, who did the Chloe. Ball. Sorry, did I say Caitlin Clark? Sorry. That's another gymnast. Yeah. <sighs> Chloe you, Clark. You were in the family of gymnasts, <laughs> <laughs> at least. <laughs> um, you were in the right sport. <laughs> There's another gymnast. Um, that was also the same meet when Trinity got the 10 on beam for a step on her dismount. And then they had the camera on her when their score came up and she just went, nope. Went, mm, <laughs> college judging is a joke. That was her <laughs> facial comment. I don't think so. Yep. Uh, number eight is the one that Spencer and I agree on more than anything in the whole entire world. And it's been a problem ever since 2016 and it will never stop being a problem and we're not over it. The U.S. World Team being selected by the all-around standings again, again. I don't. I don't have words for it. I'm just gonna scream in math <laughs> for a while. Um, but yeah, and then we're putting out a report that says we know that Kalia Lincoln was on the top four high-scoring teams, but we're not gonna do that. Gonna take her and put her on. We're the gonna team. prioritize being safe in qualification a competition that we were already going to qualify to the team final through regardless. Right. It's their, well, how did you say it? It's a, uh, they are um, planning a team to lose, not to win. Yeah. I think you said that, but I good. Oh, Thank yeah. you for giving me credit, well, but I think that, I think that was. Genius. <laughs> yes. You want to plan that you want the highest scoring team in case it comes down to being very, very close, a.k.a. the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Okay, number, what number are we on now? We're up oh, to we're number seven. No. Number seven, Oklahoma beats Florida for the NCAA women's gymnastics title by a margin of 0.15. The question is, because I think we discussed at the time, we both felt it was very, very close. And we had judges rescoring. It was a tenth this way. It was a tenth that way. I had Florida by half tenth. Someone else had Oklahoma by a tenth. It's back and forth. Was it controversial because Oklahoma has won so many times and was the favorite and it's like fun to root for an underdog? Or was it controversial because Florida was actually better? I think it's only controversial because uh, college judging is an actual joke. <laughs> and they literally have unwritten rules that you're supposed to follow. And the judges are literally told to follow the unwritten rules, not the written rules. And that is why there's any room for it to be controversial. Um, I think if the judging was actually um, consistent and transparent, that there would be less controversy. But I think it's only controversial because people love a dynasty and hate a dynasty. And mm -hmm. Oklahoma is currently a dynasty. Mm -hmm. N coming in at number Wait. six on our list. Whoa. We, we must have, we have a timeout from Jessica. We have a timeout. Pick number six comes in. Because I want to talk about how it is that um that we in the Cooper O'Byrne family found out that uh fact checker's dad was in a flying club where he walked on the wing of a plane. Yeah, in high school. They were like, oh, come fly planes in high school. Um, and also that someone's parent, I don't know if you can figure out who's used to sneak out the window um, from the cabin in the woods that her parents literally built with their own two hands um, in middle school would sneak out into the woods to meet up with her boyfriend. Somebody's parent did that. I don't know if you could guess who's. Um, how, how did I find those things out? Um, because of StoryWorth. StoryWorth is an online service that helps you and your loved ones preserve precious memories like these stories for years to come thoughtful meaningful gift you can give story worth um, that connects you with those who matter most in your life and every week story worth sends an email to your relative friend 
whoever you love in your life that you want to know all their stories, um, thought provoking questions they have. It's your choice of questions. So I give this gift to my mom. I can choose the questions. There's a bunch of options that you can use. Um, and each prompt ask questions that like you might not have ever thought to ask Spencer, like mm. what's the bravest thing you've ever done in your life? Have you asked your parents that? No. Okay. If you could see into the future, what would you want to find out? Have you asked anybody that? No. These are the kind of questions that you could ask. After one year, StoryWorth compiles all of your loved ones' stories, including photos, which I love, into a beautiful keepsake book that you can share and revisit for generations to come. Like on our side of the family, uh, my sister-in-law got the book for the wider family, for the three sons of Coop's uh, parents. And now like the grandkids are going to have these basically memoirs with photos written by their grandparents that they can read and like look into, you know, who were they? What did they say about this? Learn about them. And I love that. So um, I live on the other side of the country from my family. Um, so reading these weekly stories is a great way, way to keep in touch on a regular basis. I just love this. With StoryWorth, I'm giving those I love the most a thoughtful personal gift from the heart and preserving their memories and stories for years to come. Go to storyworth.com slash gymcastic to save $10 on your first purchase. That's storyworth.com slash gymcastic to save $10 on your first purchase. And now it's time for number, what number are we on? We're up to number six on the list. Okay. Number six. I'm ready. Number six. Heath Thorpe not being included on the Australian world's team, despite winning the national all around championship. And despite Australia sending then a team to worlds that was not able to have enough routines to get a team score. And despite Australia being told to repick the team after there was an appeal and they left Heath Thorpe off the team, so they were told to repick the team after the, the appeal, and they repicked the exact same team. And when asked about it, they said, well, it's because of our mandate is to qualify a team to the Olympics. So that's why we're not taking the all-around champion. And then at World Championships, they didn't compete enough people to even qualify a team. So Australian gymnastics jail continuing to be a thing. Mm -hmm. See Georgia Godwin not being put on a team and then the team not scoring high enough to send a team to Worlds, all being the reason that so many gymnastics fans around the world and gymnasts in Australia can't stand Australian gymnastics. Number five, Suni Lee has to compete two events at the U.S. Classic for some reason. Some reason being because she didn't go to camp. So she had to get her two event score, qualifying score at Classic to stay in the picture, despite being the reigning Olympic all around champion and having and despite... clearly proved that she has the gymnastics level not to need to be gate kept by a qualifying procedure and that you should have opportunities for a gymnast like SUNY to bypass qualification systems because of what they've done before in order to preserve their health as much as possible. And despite having competed in college for two and a half months of routines that they could have used as evidence of her ability to get a 13.5 or whatever she needed on beam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ridiculous. And this rule needs to change. And the whole, you have to show up to camp. You can't just like not go to camp, not participate in the system and then just show up and qualify for a team. Most ridiculous thing ever. Mm. Gatekeeping. Number, Number four. four. The FIG readmitting Russian athletes in theory, but only with rules no possible athlete could meet, including cannot have indicated support for Russia's war in a way that all of them have, and an app, the deadline for applying for neutral athlete status had to be submitted 60 days before the registration deadline of the event, which when these rules were released was already too late for some of the Olympic qualifiers. Yeah. It, yeah. Just say no, just take a stand against yeah, the IOC almost. and just say no, instead of making up these ridiculous rules. Um, number three, number three, 
Denver and oh. LSU advance to NCAA nationals over Michigan in the Denver regional final, which Denver won and LSU qualified in second over Michigan on a tiebreak. And how many folks felt about this? <laughs> And now, our, the- our gymnastic rescore had Michigan winning this competition in first place by three tenths over LSU and Denver, which is why we rank it so high on the controversy scale, because the results did not seem to pass the eye test. Yes, at all. Re- like, completely ridiculous. Like, the reigning national champions, Michigan. Not the reigning national champions, Was but the a recent before? national champion. Yes. The which two- is it's not okay. that. That doesn't, it is not part of it. If you no. were bad, even though but you they're won the really year before, good, yeah, you know, uh, not, yeah, not making it to a uh, championship, which has happened before to teams that had previously won a national championship. Oh, yeah. But this was like the biggest controversy, I think, in uh, college gymnastics in a very, very, very long time. This, and this is another reason why, if you want to be happy, don't pay attention to the judging because it's <laughs> and don't have a team that you root for. Because <laughs> they will break your heart. That's the, that's, just that's the, the rule. Love it for. for the art. This is why. Just enjoy the art, enjoy, and just ignore everything else. That's that's my best advice. This is why we have a mocktail and cocktail menu for 2024 for college mm. and cocktails already ready for you. <laughs> you <can download laughs> because it. you're going to need it. <laughs> you're going to need it to make it through, ignoring the judging. Yeah. Okay, yeah. number two. Spencer has come with the receipts. I have so many receipts. You guys have been waiting for this for months. Yeah, months. If you're a visual listener, Um, you can watch along with these important gifts. Number two, Zheng Qingying of China being deducted for her back dive in the world team final. Her transverse back dive on beam. So we have qualification. She hit it the best she did it how it's supposed to look, how it's supposed to be, and scored a 14-1 on beam. Then we go to the team final. An otherwise very strong beam routine, hit beam routine, but her transverse back dive, which is not a Yurchenko loop. Sometimes people call it a Yurchenko loop, but the Yurchenko loop has to have a full hip circle afterward. Um, Her team final routine, otherwise hit, but she's over on her transverse back way dive. over has way in grab, front by her head way side. front over has to grab critically has to grab the back of the beam to push herself right. back up yeah scores 13.266 that's not only then deduction we, because she basically almost fell on the beam but then she had to make an adjustment which is another deduction deduction to get herself back up so no lots of deduction. but okay jessica's wrong um then I feel like we that's go definitely to... an adjustment or precision. Same difference. Oh, yeah. A preci- like a precision. Fine. That's yeah. like one ten. I'm not talking about that. Then we go to event finals. A routine in which Jung fell earlier in the routine on her switch ring fell onto the beam, which is one point. Does the same thing on her back dive as in the team final. She's over, has to grab the back of the beam and push herself back up. But for that score, routine scores a 13-1, just one point, just point one six six lower than the team final, despite this routine including another fall that the team final one did not include, indicating that this mistake that was identical in both the team final and the event final was evaluated differently in those two phases of the competition. This being the best argument for why we need receipts, because what actually did you take at which point of the competition and why? And no one benefits from not knowing. Yes. FIG newsletter released this week confirms that it should be this should be a 0.5 off for grabbing the beam to avoid a fall. Just like if you have a big wobble, you reach down, you grab the beam, but you stay on, it's 0.5. It's not a fall onto the apparatus, which is a 1.0 deduction. This would be a 0.5 grabbing the beam to avoid a fall. Unlike what Jessica was telling us during the competition. <laughs> I'm waiting. Like, I was like, I saw these gifts and I was like, all right, here we go. 
Yeah. Here we go. No, but you get a free pass for anything that happens in the second half of Worlds. I think if you're there, <laughs> you're any so takes awesome. during the second half of Worlds because you're you you're you've gone. You're gone. Your brain is wrong, and you're gone. <laughs> and that's just what's given. Anything you say to another person that you later regret, it doesn't count because it was the second week of Worlds. And those are the rules. It just doesn't count because you 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 don't know what's happening at any moment. Um. It is interesting seeing these from the TV angle as opposed to mm-hmm. basically directly in front of the beam. So tw- it's like on the side that her head was on, which is directly behind the judges, because it didn't look as bad. One of these didn't look as bad. Uh, the mm-hmm. team, the event final one, I think. Yeah, did I, not think, look I as think bad that was what you team I final think that one. Was your take at the time, the event final yeah. was different. because the. Uh, the um, but it's clear looking at this from this angle that both the event final and the team final, she lands like hip bone over the beam almost. Yeah, um, way over. She almost misses this, her. This does hands. not seem like a fun skill to do, pain wise. Is what I'm. Oh saying. no, it's not something you'd watch and be like, I would enjoy doing that. <laughs> it's one of those things. If you catch it perfectly, you feel nothing. Mm. But then ninety nine percent of the time. You're not going to catch it perfectly, and you're going to hit your hips or your pubic bone or the top of your thighs so hard. Or, worst of all, you're too far backwards towards your feet, and you break your ribs doing it. Another fun part of of doing this skill. So, let's hope none of that happened. One other thing I do want to say is the question of whether the way this was scored in the team final, which we believe was evaluated as a full fall onto the apparatus yeah that's how i reconcile what scores that she actually got that they are scoring team final as a fall into the apparatus and event final as an oh as a 0.5 deduction even though they were the same problem but if we assume that team final was she was taken a point was taken when it should have been 0.5 that still wouldn't have been enough to change the medal standings because china was nine tenths out of uh bronze medal so if you give Jung five tenths back for a misevaluated mistake that still doesn't push China up to bronze. So, so just in case that becomes like, oh, if they had scored Jung's correct, like 10 years from now, we're like, well, you know, if they had scored Jung's beam correctly, China would have meddled. They would not. Not that alone. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure we can find other There's reasons. There's other things, yeah. <laughs> for things being misevaluated, we can get China to that bronze somehow, but not for that problem. But if this, you think this is bad, this is nothing compared nothing. to college gymnastics judging. Oh, I thought you were going to say nothing compared to number one on our list. <laughs> oh, nothing compared one to number one, but... Which should come as no surprise, the World Championships vault final, where the wrong athlete was in it. <laughs> yeah, that was Oops. the worst thing that happened. Hands down. Yeah, that's the worst, like, the, uh, meat management s- problem at a major meet, I think, since the Sydney vault debacle. Yeah. I'm not saying it's at the level of the Sydney vault debacle, because this didn't potentially hurt people physically. But, you know, it's it's getting there. We're getting there. So what happened was, Joss Robertson is injured. She withdraws from the vault final. That should then have, including, you know, everyone's withdrawing from everything. Um, Leanne Wong had previously been tuper countryed out of the vault final. She was then no longer tuper countryed because Robertson had withdrawn, but she was not on the alternate list because she was tuper countryed. So uh, Bachskoy of Hungary was placed into the vault final. The U.S. had to appeal, saying, oh, it should have been Leanne Wong. She was then also placed into the vault final. So you would think everyone wins, everyone gets to compete. But what ended up happening was Bachskoy's result meant she became the Olympic qualifier for Hungary rather than Zoya Sekai, who would have qualified from bars otherwise. So the mistake changed who qualified to the Olympics, which is kind of a big deal. A huge deal. Like it didn't injure them physically, but Zoya injured Mm -hmm. mentally big time. And she posted about this and we are still waiting for her uh, lawsuit or appeal to Cass or something. Because this was a big mistake. You should always, it should always be the people who score the highest, even if they were two per country out, who get in first to their rightful place yeah, score. You mean the qualification okay. standings should qualification determine standing. who makes the event final? Yeah. Right. Not who's on the reserve list. So this is why we've proposed literally printing the list with the an asterisk and indentation. 
here's the person that's going to replace because they were too per country before you even get to the mm -hmm. actual reserve list. So cluster. That's what that mm -hmm. was. That was mm -hmm. bad, 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 bad. So what are your, if you're going to pick the single best routines of the year, mm. what would you choose? Yeah. The first thing that comes to mind is Simone's floor from Nationals Day 2, which was the best, Yeah, might be her best floor of her career. Yeah. Is that out on a limb or no. just in terms of landing control, in terms of everything it was she's always great obviously but there'll be like a bounce there'll be a thing she's doing super hard tumbling and she has all of this x can do more than she's doing this landings wise was just like oh i'm on i've nailed yeah. this i've nailed every single thing about this routine this is the best i've ever done it yep and just thinking about like her tumbling on that day too it was just i mean her technique is always so amazing but she just put everything straight up in the air um and straight up in the air, perfect twist, straight back down. It was just, it should be studied and used as the examples uh, in every biomechanics and physics books for centuries. Just when books have <laughs> gifts because they're only electronic in the future, that's what should be in there. Just absolutely, absolutely beautiful. Um, what about Andrade's Pan Am vault mm. in the final? That the best has been, the, we've which we crowned the best chung ever. The best ever of all time, including Chung Fei and yeah. Zamaripa and Simone. and Simone. Yeah. We think it was the best ever. The yeah. best. Like it, yeah. It's astronomically ridiculously fantastic. Mm -hmm. And she also always a, had a fantastic. Also a chunk. solid, solid nominee. I had no arguments with this nominee. In the category of best routine of the year that didn't win, going back to Zheng Qingying, I would say her beam in the event final at Chinese Nationals, which ended up silver because of D-score and things, but that was, that's my best routine. We had no issues with the back dive, the transverse back dive. It was great. That's my best routine that didn't win gold in its competition nominee. I want to nominate for avant-gardeness and doing Good. something totally mm -hmm. different that hasn't been mm -hmm. done before. Um, because, you know, anytime Brooklyn Moores breathes, sure. I'm like, yes. obviously she's the most interesting and artistic and wonderful gymnast on the planet. Um, but Sana Weaver's beam choreography that was done by, I guess, the uh, Dancing with the Stars, whatever their Dancing with the Stars is called, I think um, choreographed it, one of the people on that show. It's so different. Um, I, I've never seen choreography like that. Um, it would be called lyrical or modern, I think. Um, it's so unusual, unusual positions, unusual it's it just completely revolutionary in terms of beam choreography. And I'm saying going back to the days of really weird things in the late sixties, early seventies, <laughs> like thinking of when, uh, like that floor routine, ants in her pants floor routine that Marta Crowley oh. choreographed for one mm -hmm. of the Romanian gymnasts back in the day. That is so weird. Um, <laughs> literally thinks like, <laughs> like there's a snake in her pants that she's trying to get, <laughs> get it out. Ants crawling down her legs. Um, like it's pushing the envelope again, which is something we expect from the Netherlands as a program is doing something really different and unique like that. Um, any other routines? Any other? I started to ask you first. I don't have any you. other routines. I did my I did my uh, contributions. Um, no, these are all right. In terms I, of elite, I'm good with. This. I would like you to take us through your best mixed zone moments of 2023 or interview moments because as we know i do not go to the mix zone because i'm scared of it and i feel that's okay because simone also hates it so i'm like simone and i are the same uh but i find it scary so jessica goes there what are your best mix zone interview moments for 2023 so um the best mix zone moments and uh, first of all you have been to the mix zone at least twice when i forced <laughs> you to stand next to me in case i forgot something um, I used to go to the mix zone before I knew I could just tell Jessica I don't want to do things and it's fine. <laughs> like back when I thought I had to like 
do what you asked me to do. Oh, I was so young and stupid that um, I would go to the mix zone. Now I'm just like, no, and it's fine. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, and we have a happier Spencer that way. So, mm -hmm. and I'm better at not forgetting things in the mix zone. I didn't have any corrections or notes from Deanna this year. I Ooh. finally got to my elite level at the, in the mix zone. Uh, you, yes. you peaked. I, it's all downhill. Well. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> <laughs> so um so i mean the thing about the mix zone right you have like 200 athletes and anyone at any time like you can ask to talk to people you're prepared for but also one of my favorite things about the mix zone is once athletes know you and they like you they just jump in front of you and are like hey interview me now and i'm like yes we would love to and then i'm like okay let me remember everything you just did for the last two hours and don't confuse it with the other days or any of the other history of your entire career and let me ask some questions so you know it's like you think it's easy, but it's hard. Um, and I don't mean you. I mean in general. Okay, Melanie is mm -hmm. my. I'm I'm going. Well, I don't know. I don't have these in order because that's, that's. I know that's not fair to make <laughs> you put, to make you rank. Because how your, dare you? All so, of your beloveds. When we asked Melanie how the food was in the U.S., how was she dealing with it? And she said. Um, oh, it's not very good. She was like, the French food is better, and put her hand up by her head, like, mm, yeah, French food is better. But she was like. The meat in Texas is good and did the French chef's literal chef's kiss with her fingers into the air. Oh, this, I mean, why isn't this a gift for everything? Like it's the, the one of the greatest gymnastics moments ever. Mm -hmm. um, that was one of my favorites. Okay, then this might be number one of all time ever in the history Whoa. of gymnastic asking athletes questions. Um, Ethor Thorsdotter from the Netherlands. One time I ship my pants. <laughs> fantastic yeah just 10 out of 10 and i was like what's your most embarrassing moment and she said i thought i was never gonna tell anybody this <laughs> and then told the story when she was competing and she had been kind of sick and she had a poopy leotard and then after she told that story and people started to hear you know watch the video and hear mm -hmm. the audio and um, and talk about it that other athletes came up to her and was like, Oh my God, that happened to me. When her coach is going like, like you did what <laughs> you didn't. Yes. I told the story. Um, but you know, I, like if, if this is going to happen to you once in your lifetime, so why not get it over with early when, you know, when you're young and wearing a leotard and then someone else came up to her and was like, Oh my God, I remember that meet where you pooped your pants. <laughs> so basically you guys have nothing to be ashamed of anymore. No. Ithora no. has topped everything. Yeah. So anything and coaches out there, like if you ever have an athlete that's super embarrassed, just play this video of Ithora talking about the meet where, where she pooped her pants and they won't be embarrassed anymore. This is like the greatest gift might be a better gift than all of her artistic, beautiful zombie ballerina <laughs> routines of all time. This yeah. is the real gift that Athora has given us. Uh, my other favorite moment from the mix zone was uh, the Netherlands boys, uh, Casimir always, Schmidt always a classic. and Bartjolo, who came back from retirement, uh, competing in the mix zone for Heath's attention by offering to take off items of clothing to show the, them like tattoos or designs <laughs> that kind of stuff that was one of one of the highlights absolute highlights and then it's not a mix zone moment but my other favorite moment of the year was of course simone biles at mm -hmm. world championships this year um guaranteed to win a medal essentially just from being simone and but then um a chasse attacks <laughs> <laughs> Every time I watch this, it's so funny. She tripped on the floor. <laughs> when she tripped, oh, it almost fell right on her face. Like, this is where her real athletic prowess showed. Most people mm -hmm. would have broken a tooth on a carpeted <laughs> springboard, yeah. spring loaded floor. Mm -hmm. But she didn't even fall over when that chasse attacked during her floor routine at Worlds. And, and also, she just giggled and walked to the corner. Oh, yeah. one of the greatest moments of all time. Oh, so good. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, I mean, the other great gift that this year gave us. Uh, this is better than the Nanning Bee, by far. Oh, yeah. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. Big, big statement. Yeah, it is. Huh. Oh, so good. I mean, did anything make you laugh harder than that? 
over and over oh, no, 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 this no, no, year. No. That's 100% first yeah. place. And really, that is our qualification. Because as the balance beam situation says, gymnastics is a comedy, not a drama. Yeah, it is. And that proves it. Yeah. Oh, Maybe so the only, like on that list of things that made us laugh the hardest, which was not a segment we planned, but we're going into it now because why yeah. not? Let's do it. That um, fluff ESPN college gymnastics fluff piece about KJ, where she's dressed like a cowboy and is lassoing all of the gymnasts, that made me laugh <laughs> very hard. And I still don't really get it. And I love that it exists where she's just roping gymnasts. And you're like, all right, this is what we're doing now. Wasn't that the one where they also had like the, the chuck wagon too? Yeah. Like if there was literally a wagon and uh -huh. I was like, what is happening right now? <laughs> that was excellent. I'm offended for the state of Oklahoma by this stereotype. I mean, if you're talking about stereotypes about Oklahoma, that's not, like, on the top ten most negative. <laughs> no. There's so many other things that we could get to. Oh, good times. Some people just like to give us no-strings-attached money. They don't want to bother with joining Club Gym Nerd, and so they just donate. You can find our donate button for a no-strings-attached donation at the bottom of the club page at gymcastic.com forward slash club. We have a mini commission this week. And today's mini commission is brought to you by Club Gym Nerd member at the world champion level, which you can mm. give as a gift. And again, if you want to give any of the Gymcastic membership levels as a gift, we will record a video for you saying congratulations so-and-so and whatever you want, but it has to be, give us like a sentence to say, and we'll do that um, for you. Um, and you can just make sure you check the box when you're buying the membership level that it's a gift. But you only have until Friday to do this, Friday the 22nd. That's the last opportunity to get one of these. Like, it has to be in the morning because we record that day and then we throw our computers away for two weeks. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I'll be doing. So um, here is what this Club Gym member asked for in the mini commission. Uh, quote, someone on Twitter, that's what we're calling them. Per Spencer's description on me, in a reference to Danelle Leva's response to my tweet about coming back just for high bar, uh, it's from the Jonathan Horton interview, and it still applies and is relevant right now, or just call me Sean. All right. We're talking about the scoring of Michaela Maroney's vaults at the 2012 Olympics and how is something fishy going on here? Not unlike the Jung Ching Ying fall not a fall evaluation that we discussed earlier in the episode so Michaela Maroney's vault in 2012 team final don't need to describe it to you if you're listening to this show you've watched it 50 to 75 times in your life we all know what we're talking about 2012 team final vault execution score 9.733 so first question do now we this agree is the vault where she that she sticks Cold. This is the one. This is the, the one. one. The one. Where the Cheryl Michael Hamilton, Maroney. yeah, Cheryl Hamilton, the the top rated uh, brevet judge in the Olympics, mouth dropped open. I'm just saying that you don't yeah, often no, see that. For I know. It, I know, and you should never see it. Is what my reaction. Yes, they is. should be completely stoic, but sometimes that you can't be. That happen. wasn't the first time her um, mouth dropped open, but that is an unavoidable human reaction to watching Michaela Rona's team final vault that she stuck cold, and it was beautiful. So the scores. First of all, so first question: nine point seven three three execution. Do we agree? Where did the deductions come from? If we're playing the role of scoring robot that might exist in the future and might just be a scam and we're not really clear on what we're doing with the robot judging but if we're the role of robot judge what should it have been given versus 9.733 the execution score that i got jessica i mean i'm like maybe legs on leg separation pre-flight yeah there's always a little yeah yeah, maybe knees in pre-flight. Do you say legs in post-flight? No. L little, 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 little bit? No, not if you're judging by her bones and joints instead of her muscles, okay. which is a big oh, problem. Right. Yeah. That I so you're don't... saying, so what's your execution score for this vault? Like, Jesco Burns on the E-panel, representing the United States, 
and her mouth didn't drop open because she has to maintain stoicism, what execution score did you give this vault? I would have given this vault a 10. Okay. I, I think it's a I'll allow it. Yeah. I'm saying maybe it's because like I don't see any of the things that I just saw. Mm-hmm. But maybe in the moment, the sitting where the judges were, they saw something that we don't see from the TV angle. I'm giving maybes, but I would have absolutely given it a 10 because I think this is absolutely the best this vault can possibly be done, period. The question that we're delving into now is consistency of scoring, comparing this vault to the event final, where her execution score on the Aminar, not talking about the fall in her second vault, but the Aminar first vault, execution score she received there was 9.666 so almost the same as the team final vault whereas this vault first of all oh she did not stick it landing deduction hop forward i would also say a little bit softer in the knees in post flight in this instance a little bit more off direction but the biggest issue being the hop forward this is not as strong as the team final vault. I don't think anyone watching this from any angle would say this vault is at the level of the team final vault because the team final vault's the best one there's ever been. And this one isn't the best one there's ever been. Um, yeah. The question being, wait, if the event final one is 9.666, how was it team final only 9.733? Regrets? Were they adjusting to the outrage of the team final vault? That this did not receive that that didn't receive a 10, that it got 9.733. So delving into the results and the results book and the scores for each, each judge gave in for both of these vaults to see what we can learn. So execution panel was different, first of all, somewhat between team final and the event final. So it was not all of the same judges, but two of the execution judges were the same. Mao of China and Sakurai of Japan Mao was execution one in the team final and execution four in the event final. Sakurai was execution judge two in both. So same position, both vaults. Both of those judges gave nine, seven execution scores to both vaults. The team final stuck and the event final hop forward. And that's where I think we can draw the conclusion that there was an adjustment post team final in how this was evaluated because the two mm. judges who were the same person judging both vaults gave it the same score, even though the event final vault should never have scored the same as the team final vault. Cause the team final vault's the best one ever. Yes. I agree. That is, that's, that's where I'm going. So conclusion, Michaela Maroney's vaults 2012. Was there something fishy going on? Yes. Because you shouldn't change how you're evaluating things midstream mid competition. Exactly. That is, it, that is what I have to say on Michaela Maroney's vaults. Tap, tap, tap. Case closed. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah. I mean, I think this is, we see judging adjustments happen. Like we always talk about this, how the 2017 code, we literally talked about it in this episode, the 2017 mm-hmm. co- code where you got, uh, you know, fives and threes and sixes as the execution score on beam is the same code they just used at the Tokyo 2022, 2021, 2020 Olympics. What year was it? It took place in 2021. It was allegedly the 2020 Olympics. Same code. The the Tokyo Olympics no longer has taken place during a period of time. It was just a concept. (laughs) We're just, yes, calling it. Same code. E-score judging on on beam, completely different. So, Mm -hmm. but that's the thing. All of this should be set in stone at the beginning of, wait, before a meet. And it should be set in stone when the code is released and not be adjusted, adjusted, adjusted up to the Olympics. Um, So, and the judges have uh, been picked for the Paris Olympics. They're in, the names are done. They are, and they're, they have a whole system. They do it now. They hired a data scientist, a mathematician who came up with a system and it is the most consistent judges who are judging no matter where they are, no matter who they're judging, no matter what level, they are always judging the same. Those are the people they have picked. And I think we saw that in Tokyo. Like, it was very consistent consistent judging um, in Tokyo. So, thank you so much for your mini commission. If you guys want to also get a mini commission, you can find it at gymcast.com on the you join the join the club tab. And again, remember, you can give this in a, as a gift. Just remember to click the this is a gift button. And... Uh, 
we hope we see more of these from you guys. Some Gymternet news. Japan, as they do, mm. like to pick people way, way, way ahead of time, especially yes. if they're an Olympic champion for the Olympic <laughs> team. So Hashimoto Daiki has been selected for the 2024 Paris Olympic Games. Um, his teammates will be chosen later, which would probably be like tomorrow, six, six <laughs> months before the Olympics, probably. So February ish, January. Well, they're based on as they typically do. It'll be after the NHK competition, based yep. on the results of the All Japan Championships and NHK. Um, but as last year, Hashimoto gets an automatic spot for being world champion. Yep. So that's the justification. It's not just like Hashi we've already picked Hashimoto just because we love him. Um, but yeah. So if the US were to write a selection procedure that said Simone's already on the Olympic team because she's Simone. Support or do not support. I don't support this because I think you should pick the best people at the time. I would support if you're the Olympic champion or world champion, you can automatically go straight to national championships and mm -hmm. make your teams Would that you way. Would you say Not straight Olympic to Olympic trials? trials? Not, Not straight, straight, straight to Olympic, Olympic trials. trials. Okay. Yeah, because it's not fair uh, for someone to have to compete two meets in a row and for someone else not to have to compete. So mm -hmm. you can qualify really early to national championships and then get like, you know, a couple months break and then have to compete again. But if you're going to have two classic meets back Classic is optimal. We all agree. Yeah. Classic. Classic is, classic is yeah. Classic Especially just your, year your last you shot. Trials. <laughs> right. And you, right. You have all these extra meets. So I don't agree with that. What do you think? I agree. I wouldn't have a procedure that automatically has someone on a team based on their past accomplishments, even if it's Simone. Yeah. Uh, ESPN is having, they've released their big gymnastics yeah. hours. It's out. Yes. The TV More schedule. Than Finally, seven. much later than last year, I'm going to say, when it was out in November, at the end of November, we had to wait well into December this year. And I'm gonna. I I noticed is what I'm saying. <laughs> Spencer is not happy with this coming out so late. <laughs> so more than 70 hours across ESPN platforms between regular season, conference championships, uh, NCAA post and preseason, and all post all that stuff. So it's including and ABC is broadcasting the 2024 national championships. Um, mm -hmm. That'll be live April 20th. And then they have the inaugural season of the ACC Network Gymnastics, the mm -hmm. ACC, uh, whatever yeah. that stands for, plus the <laughs> Collegiate Quad. Atlantic well, Coast Conference? Is that what it is? Oh, there we go. The East Coast. Conference. So they'll have some, that's the gymnastics, women's gymnastics teams wise, that's now Clemson's in that, North Carolina, NC State, and Pitt are there and then Cal and Stanford will join them next season. So they'll be all be in that ACC network televised meets group. And that first collegiate quad meet is going to be on January 13th on ABC and it's Oklahoma, LSU, Utah, and UCLA. Mm -hmm. Yes. There so. are multiple sessions. Um, some of them are on AC the ACC network, like the one with Cal or getting on the ACC, ACC early. Um, and then the, the big, the big one, the ABC one. That's the, the Vegas top. meet. No, this is not the Vegas meet. This is oh, the okay. Utah meet. This is the okay, fake God. Utah that's actually not in Salt Lake City, but is in Salt Lake City. Oh, that's right. I can't keep up with these names. There's the, yeah, yeah they should just call it and the place, and then I'll know what it is. <laughs> so exciting that uh, ESPN is leaning into more gymnastics coverage mm -hmm. and keeps leaning in more. And they do great, they do great coverage, you guys. Protractors, the stuff that you got finally on NBC this <laughs> There's year. Great stuff, you guys. Protractors. <laughs> this this broadcast has everything. <laughs> Protractors, lines, drawing on the screen. The only thing they Kathy don't have Johnson yet. Johnson moaning. <laughs> the only thing they don't have yet is uh, a um, live the scoring on the screen, like the figure skating has. That's my no, last request. That's not how it works. Yeah. Yeah. But they have actual, like, update the scores in real time, which some other college broadcasts. Don't. Yeah. Really. There's that. 
We have some really exciting stuff coming up for you um, over our break. We um, normally, you know, behind the scenes is a secret. It's private. It's just for Club Gymner members. But we are going to give you guys a peek at behind the scenes over the next two weeks where we are taking a well-deserved break. Um, and I realized I was we ha do more podcasts in a year than most other professional podcasters. Like we do so many episodes. In yes. a year, we do some. We've done like 120 something more than that this year. Yeah, it's a lot. I do not know. We do a lot of episodes every week. So, um, and we can afford to actually take a break and relax our minds so we can be at our best for you because of our Club Gymner members. Um, so, anyway, we're going to give you a preview and hoping you will um, love what you hear and want to listen to all the back episodes of Behind the Scenes by becoming a Club Gym Nerd member. So we're going to give you some peeks into that over the next two weeks in our best of episodes, um, but it's best of, but never heard before. Um, and we're going to get our college ranking up um, before the season starts. Remember, our Ooh. virtual live show season pass, the first time we're ever offering that, is going to be is available now, so you can get that. Gymcastic Fantasy League is launching Friday. If you want to get our newsletter that announces all of this stuff and you already got links to it, um, it's go to the gymcastic.com navigation about and then go to Gymcastic Newsletters. Uh, your entire college and cocktails menu, including the mocktails, is already created for you by Linzers. Um, and there's a link in the forum for that. And um, there are links to all of this in the show notes. And please, this is the most important thing, you guys. Before you go on vacation, remember to set your podcast player to automatically down, uh, download Gymcastic because you don't want to be on a plane or some place in the woods with no Wi-Fi and you haven't already downloaded your episodes. So then you're stuck with no Gymcastic to listen when you're trying to drown out your drunk uncle or whatever. So make sure you set it to automatically download the shows because this is how you get through the holidays. <laughs> um Thank you so much, everyone, for another amazing year. We have one more podcast this year, which is Behind the Scenes on Friday at noon Pacific, our last Behind the Scenes of the year. We will celebrate with you. Spencer might even drink live on the show, which is I'm just informing him of this now. I'm, I'm making which... no promises. That's We save that for college season. Oh, it's so good, you guys. College of Cocktails is so fun. <laughs> Where Spencer drinks and I do not. Um, anyway, so thank you guys so much. We'll see you on Friday. Um, and I hope you enjoy our, uh, our treats, our behind the scenes episodes, uh, while we're on a uh, break. Thank you for another great year. We appreciate you so much. Thank you so much to all of our Club Gymner members. Until Friday, remember to take off a gay, split on rights, and we'll see you on Friday at noon Pacific for behind the scenes. Thank you for listening. You can check it out because. Just said that. Sorry, I blanked out there for a minute, so I'll just... <laughs> <laughs> I was totally thinking about something else. What am I going to talk about? Mm, mm. <laughs> this will go in the outtakes. I tried to keep it not boring. I was like, Spencer, you did you've got to make this not boring. boring. And then I did the stuff you care about the most, and you still spaced out. <laughs>